we're going to continue along the themes of what agencies are doing. Uh, John Rossi is our next speaker. He's general manager at Western Municipal Water District, which is out in Riverside. And uh, I don't know if this is the first time, but you are a published author now in the book that I saw, which is his presentation is going to be based on. And I didn't bring my book. I would have had you sign it. Yeah. But uh, it was a book that uh, a professor from UC Riverside um, helped edit, and there were a number of, it was all about drought. And um, John's presentation is going to be on the potential political impacts in Southern California of drought-related water availability and rate increases. So this will be an easy subject, right, John? Sure. Thank you, Jeff. You're going to keep me on time too, right? Okay. okay. Well, I appreciate this opportunity to share some thoughts that I'm passionate about. I've been general manager at Western now about 10 years and, and doing the general manager thing about 15 total. And uh, I have to say that I'm passionate about the subject, uh, although my next job hopefully is not going to be a retail manager but a wholesale manager, so I don't have 218 rate hearings. So, so for those of you that know what that is, you can laugh. The, the idea, though, that I um, have a chance to think about the challenges we have with connecting with customers. So I'm really grateful for Paul setting up the complexity. He and the Irvine Ranch uh, board and, and staff are very humble. It's probably one of the most cutting edge water use or, or water reliability type projects in, in certainly in the state, if not the country, given all the challenges with water rights and, and connecting with people. And similarly with Darcy setting up the discussion about how hard it is to connect with customers. I want to touch a little bit on both of those issues. So overview here, want to talk about some of the things that have happened. And when I say drought here, it's really kind of two aspects, certainly uh, climatology and some of the challenges we've had with water supply over the last several years, but also we call it, kind of call it a regulatory drought. I said that to one of my board members who's a retired judge, and he got really upset with me. The judge applied the law, talking about the 2007 uh, you know, issues related to the Delta smelt. Well, that, that related in shortages at MET that I want to talk about, and those had very significant rate increase uh, impacts. Talk about, again, the public perceptions on rate issues and then uh, some of the political uh, considerations. So, in, and again, in 2007, I started at Western in 2004, and I came from a groundwater, actually a couple of different agencies that were more than 50% groundwater for, as part of their supply portfolio, to an agency, Western, that was almost 100% imported water coming from the state project. It was a mills plant right there in Riverside, California, and was kind of stunned. And it so happened that very first month was a meeting at Metropolitan Water District for me. Member agencies, 26 of us get together, the managers, once a month. And they were talking about a, a renewal or a refresh of a policy, we call it the seven-day outage rule, that says to the extent that Metropolitan gives you 60 days or more notice, you have to come off their supply for seven days for a planned shutdown. Didn't think an awful lot about it. Got in uh, back in the office the next day and asked the staff and the whites of their eyes, what do you mean 60 days notice, seven days? And I said, well, how many days have we uh, got notice May 1, we shut down July 1, how many days would we have for water supply? And they said, well, I mean, how many hours? And, maybe 36 hours and we'd be out of water, literally. Uh, how can that be? So I was very compelled. Another two years went by. We, well, by the way, we started an, an integrated resource plan very quickly, the idea of how do we start broadening our portfolio. But within a couple years, we had the decision, and again, uh, Matt talking about this Delta smelt impacts in the state water project that suggested maybe in the past we had seven out of, out of 10 wet years that we'd be able to take surplus water and maybe put it in the groundwater for dry year to a new model that suggested maybe three out of 10 years. I mean, that really flipped things upside down. So your recharge basins, for example, might need to be two and a half times larger if, if they were perfectly sized. So again, a, a, a real awareness that we have some significant challenges. So after that, the very next year, Met, we all started working on, with Met staff, a shortage allocation methodology. That didn't sound good. The idea that we're gonna have uh, difficulties, their storage levels had dropped, Thank goodness they've been had foresight to build the Diamond Valley Reservoir in Hemet, California, to put 800,000 acre feet of water supply into their portfolio, along with other groundwater assets and storage on the state project. If it hadn't been for that, it would have been much, much more dire. But we started working together, and we start having conversations about now who's going to get the shortage, and what happened last time, and how do we make sure that we we induce behavior change? And oh, by the way, that met tier two price. If people have to use beyond this new allocation, we're going to go three times. You might have seen Paul's slide that had that, that penalty area. So instead of a $600 or $500, rates have gone up. You're going to pay $1,500 if you go, for every acre foot you go over the allocation. So I'm, I'm throwing a lot at you, and I'm going to come back and organize it. But the idea was these were monumental moments for 
me thinking about how am I going to communicate to two, two stakeholders, my board, first of all, because they employ me, and secondly, the, the customers, how we're going to get these two groups together in our 218 hearings to raise rates. So as a result of these challenges and the shortage allocation, uh, what that really meant was that we were going to have less water to sell. Met had revenue shortages in addition to water shortages. And you see the graphic here. We had four big rate increase years. Cumulatively, that adds to 55 percent, but cumulatively compounded, it was about 67 percent. So we went up, you know, almost, uh, what, not quite double within a four-year period. We're, we're past double now. It was a big deal. Why is that? Well, Western Municipal Water District is one of the 26 member, agency, member agencies uh, within the Metropolitan Water District. Darcy mentioned they're number three. They represent, I think, 19 percent or so, more than that with the other three cities. We're about three and a half percent of that. Eastern Municipal Water District, our next door neighbor, is another about three and a half percent. I mention the both of us because we have growth also coming at some point. Uh, I think Eastern was adding to about 1,000 meters a month before things slowed down in 06, and we'll, we'll ramp up slowly. But the, the story here is not only about how we deal with water supplies today for many agencies that aren't growing, but for those of us that are, is how are we also going to develop additional supplies and hopefully do it in a more robust and more um, diverse way. So the, the impacts then of that 2008 to 2010, that was selling less water, less water to sell. Uh, the idea that much of their portfolio, the state project, so water coming from the Delta, long ways away, is a, a fixed cost. For most of it, about $500 million a year, whether they get 10 percent or 200,000 acre feet or they get a million acre feet, they're going to pay the same amount. Well, what's happening when they're getting less water, less revenue, still have those fixed costs, we saw great pressures on, on, on reserves. Water reserves dropped, financial reserves dropped, and those large increases were the result. So the story I wanted to, to focus on here today is what happens at the retail agency level uh, we happen to have adopted about three years ago a pass-through, AB 3030 a couple years ago, allows retail agencies to uh, pass in one rate hearing up to a five-year rate increase and also it would allow for you to pass through wholesale rate increases, Metropolitan in our case, Edison energy increases and other types of, of increases and have one rate hearing. And the other four years we literally sent out a postcard in December for rate increase in January. And the reason I give you that detail is what's so fascinating is we had not an awful lot of people coming into that protest hearing, which, by the way, if you get more than 50 percent of your customers to sign a protest, you're not allowed to move forward with the rate increase. And I want to talk about that in a minute. Uh, and the reality for somebody that has 22,000 retail customers or Eastern has 130 or LA that has several million, you're really not logically or, or practically going to have very many instances where you have a 50 percent protest. But in my world, if I had 500 people come in or 1,000 people coming in, that's a protest. You know, we're probably not going to raise rates. We've, we've done something wrong. So the challenge of how you, you raise these rates and when they year after year compounded. Uh, but first, first let me, before I get into the public perception, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, why those pressures happen in, in such a short period of time. You know, you know that from a retail manager standpoint, well, let me just say it this way. I had, had some job shadowing with some high school students uh, several years ago, five, four or five years ago. And one of the students asked me, what's what's most important thing in your job as general manager? What do you think is most important? Several ideas flashed through my head, you know, retail water supply stability. Uh, but, but it came down to, and it was a pretty quick light bulb went on, number one is raising rates. Number two is, is solid, strong employees. And number three is water supply uh, reliability or a good, strong portfolio. Why in that order? Well, if you don't have the employees, you're probably not going to get many good projects moving. But if you don't have the rates, you can't do the kinds of things that, like Paul was showing up here. And we need a lot of diversif diversification. So what that says is we need to be able to communicate to our customers 10 percent, 20 percent, 60 percent over three or four years why that is so important to them. And Darcy, I mean, hats off to uh, Modoc from the perspective. They're not even a retail agency, but in working with the retail agencies, seeing again how important it is to connect to the customer. You know, when I go out and talk to people, I mention about my own circumstance. Uh, we have a lot of children, so we have a high cell phone bill, a lot of energy use. My water bill is probably one quarter of my electric bill and about one half of my uh, cell phone bill or one half of my cable bill. So, you know, is, let's not just raise rates because we want to raise rates, but what is the real value of water? And when I talked to, to people about, well, I actually said to the board about four years ago, you know, why don't we do a three-day shutdown? 
let's just turn off the water for three days. You know, we'll, we'll, everybody will understand they can't flush the toilets. It'll be very serious, and people will totally get it. And they said, well, polish your resume. I don't think it's in good shape right now, but you're going to need it, right? So, But the idea that, that people take the water for granted, and, and how do we connect? And as Darcy said, we want these positive messages, but most people, we're the gold standard in the world for water quality and for water reliability. So how do we connect? And, and there's a lot of pain that comes with these big rate increases in short periods of time. So, you know, in messaging, Drought is a great message. It, it's kind of negative, but it really gets people aware and alert. You know, what are the other ways, though, that we can connect with people? And uh, how do we help them understand that these rates need to go up? Many of you, and we heard Paul was talking a little bit earlier, or someone was talking earlier about the, the examples of, of agencies that are not able to keep up. And one of the things that's going to happen one of these days, and hopefully it's not in, in my district, is we're going to have a, a significant outage, and, and somebody's going to just have some challenges. Maybe they're going to be mechanical. Maybe their water supply, but unfortunately that gives a black eye to all of us. So how do we how do we work together to make sure that those water supplies are there? Well, again, I think number one is to make sure that we have the connection with our customers to raise rates. The, the issues, though, centered around the, kind of the political consequences. You know, many of these things are, are no surprises, but um, I, I uh, worked with my staff to do a 10-year, uh, what we call long-term financial plan. So we looked at. What are the costs to uh, deal with METS rate increases, for example, in our case? Our own uh, internal costs, Edison costs. Let's look at full replacement. Now, we're, our retail system is about 50 years old. Some are 100 years old. But real replacements, not many agencies are doing that. What that means is let's repair, replace, upgrade to keep kind of sustainable life of these assets. How long does the pipeline last? How long do, does the SCADA system last? Let's get that in this model. And then what we, we took that model of the board as a baseline and said, with what we know today, before BDCP, we're looking at 5 to 6% rate increases, uh, whether we do another diversification water supply portfolio project. And they said, that can't be possible. So we, we took us about six months to go through and really work with them to understand why that is the reality. You mean it might be 10 or 11%? Now, that's not in allocation years where we have these other spikes. It's going to be 10, 9, 10, 11% year after year to be able to have the revenue to do what we need? Yes, that, that was the answer. And I had comments like, well, what if we just, what happens to our system where we just cap it at 5% from now on? That's the biggest rate increase. And we went back and did those scenarios. So the idea, though, is to build confidence in them that they have answers for the questions and the comments they have in the, in the community, at the boardroom dais, at the, at the protest hearing, in the civic organizations they work with. I think the bottom line here is that as we worry about maybe, again, decreases in the overall average of state project water in our case, uh, other things that may happen regulatorily, but the idea that water supply reliability may continue to drop, is it's going to take courage, it's going to take confidence to be able to stand up, and not just at the protest hearing, as Darcy was saying. If you're waiting to that moment, you know, the, the battle's long, long gone. But how do we work day in and day out to help people understand that these rate increases are critical. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of, uh, lot of pushback, in, in the, and I think it's a very small amount of people that think that government employees or uh, the public sector is kind of fat happy and paid too much, and, and not to dive into either side of that argument, but that's part of the equation as well. I, most of the people that, that I work with are working a lot of hours. We have not added headcount in five or six years. We've added all kinds of plant and pumps and I.O. and all kinds of, of physical facilities. But we have those challenges as well. So, that, so it, I think the, the idea in this article was how are we going to work together? And I certainly don't have all the answers, but how do we work to provide that kind of information to those two sets of stakeholders, to our board, to our customers, to make sure that they're going to support the kind of things that we want to do? And there's a lot of regional layers as well. Paul touched on a little bit on his slides, uh, some of the, the water rights issues. There's a number of initiatives. In fact, uh, the watershed here in, in Santa Ana is, is one of the more creative, at least from my perspective, around the state, uh, Safa Santa Ana Watershed Project Authority. An initiative was started about three months ago by the five member wholesale agency managers to, uh, as part of the Santa Ana River Water Master. This is the adjudication on the surface river water flow from the 1965 judgment. And can we really look at integrating? You know, the, the judgment went in 1969 because the agencies up and down stream, the upper watershed, we call it lower watershed, had some very significant litigation and very significant fights. And 
some smart people finally got together and entered a stipulated judgment. They said, this is the way we want it to work. And that judgment had 42,000 acre feet as a commitment from the upper watershed as it hits Prado would be Orange Counties. That was the minimum flow. It would be Orange Counties downstream. Well, that peaked at about 150,000 acre feet probably seven or eight, maybe 10 years ago. This year, it might hit 85,000. I mean, it's really been declining. Recycling, a lot of it's hydrology. The, the groundwater basins are not outputting up, up above. But recycling, stormwater capture, there's a lot of things going on in this, this uh, portfolio that we talk about. But, but I think the lesson here is we can't do it on our own. We, we affect each other, possibly, and, and the goal is to float all the boats. So the idea of what if we thought about some creative ideas here to maybe take some of the water that Orange County buys at the bottom of the hill and take state project water, which has better salt uh, levels, lower salt levels at the upper watershed, or San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District at the top of the watershed, San Bernardino Mountains right below the foothills there, has 102,000 acre feet of, of uh, allocation rights in the state water project and bring that water in up above, let more water flow in the river, maybe do less recycling. You know, these are things that we've really not thought about uh, until recently, and, and it's going to be not an easy analysis. There's some hydraulic modeling there, some financial modeling, but the interesting part about it is it's not facility based. You really probably don't need to buy, build any more recharge assets, any more wells. It's how do we use that, that, those assets together. So we're starting to get beyond just the, the you know, single agency approach, uh, but how do we do that together is a good question. But a lot of that will be based on the health and the viability financially of the agencies that are, again, raising retail rates. So with that, i um, kind of whipped through that, but I wanted to uh, share some of my thoughts. Um, again, at the bottom here, developing stakeholder understanding of the value of water and then uh, an awareness that we need to keep raising rates and it takes some strong board and council leadership to be able to do that in this, uh, these trying times both economically and, and from a water supply standpoint. So with that, I want to thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Uh, Mr. Rossi. How does your team deal with the challenge of um, when it comes to the rate increase with disadvantaged communities that every penny counts? You know, one of the things, we struggled with that for, for five or six years. We had a, a board member who kept commenting a more kind of a fixed income issue, uh, same, same kind of issue, those that, that are, are economically challenged for one reason or another. And uh, Paul Brett touched on it very basic, uh, very briefly, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Just a, a moment on water budget rates. So Irvine Ranch did this 15 or 20 years ago. We implemented it a couple years ago, and a number of agencies have done it in our area. The idea that you send a, a much stronger price signal based on how efficiently people use water. Uh, the idea that you have tiers. We have two tiers that are on budget for your indoor and outdoor use. You get that based on the number of people in the home, the hydrology, and the amount of planted material. Right? So we give you an individual water budget daily. We, luckily, we have computers. And if you have a 28-day day billing cycle or 31, you get an amount of water efficiently. If you use that efficiently, your water rates actually dropped in our case. They were lowered. So it really helps a fi fixed income or an economically challenged uh, uh, EGA-type environment where if they want to use two units, you know, we have a pretty low fixed cost element as well for that reason. We really want to push the signal. Now, Conversely, or additive to that, is we have three more what we call penalty tiers. If you use another 25% of your water above your budget, your rate doubles. Goes up four times and six times. Some agencies have it ten times. So the idea is it's much like $5 gallon gasoline. People got out of their cars and got into the buses and you know, rapid transportation. So we have an aggressive system that we feel dealt with that issue as well as the water wasters. You know, we dropped from about 40% of our customers being out of budget to now we're down to 15%. Uh, but it gives a little more opportunity for customers to have control over that, that water use. If I could follow up with that, um, the, environmental justice, the environmental justice issue is certainly something to watch out for, the disadvantaged communities. But two of the worst water systems I've ever run across have been in two of the most affluent communities you've ever seen, Malibu. And Orange Park Acres here in Orange County. I mean, unbelievable. So I, I totally respect people who don't have, you know, a, a, an extra dollar when they're really living from paycheck to paycheck. But I think they'll get it if you can explain it to them well. But it's those folks who actually accumulated wealth 
who are a little bit of a harder sell sometimes because they're very skeptical. And we have more challenges with those folks. I think we in the industry convincing those folks that the right thing to do is to let us raise rates or let us bond finance new infrastructure. So it, it works both ways as far as the challenges uh, economically. So. John, Thank I you. Have, I have a question for oh, you. Sure. So um, oh, is, is, there, um, is there a set of best practices for agencies in terms of uh, working through the rate increase process? You know, I've, I've never seen it outlined. That's a good point. It's certainly something we should work on. Uh, there's, there are aspects of, of the rate model that uh, are commonly used, but I've never ever seen them under that title. Right. So I have a piece of work we got to okay. do. We uh, implemented about three different projects. So we did some desalter, connecting desalters uh, in the Chino Basin and in the Riverside Basin. We've done stormwater capture. We got a state water resources uh, uh, board permit about 2007 for 198,000 acre feet of water coming out of the uh, Seven Oaks Dam, if you remember that process. Um, so the answer to your question is we're about uh, six days now, we think. Not seven, we're getting close, but much better. Thanks okay, so much thanks. for coming. It was good to have you here.